So yay, people are logging on. Welcome everybody to the Summer Scissor session. We're gonna get started in a few minutes as more people are, are coming in, 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 in the virtual door. <laughs> Oh, yay, everybody's on time. Yay. so quiet without a bunch of people in the room. <laughs> Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to our second, uh, a second session of our Summer Scissors series. This sum si Summer Scissors series, <laughs> got to say that fast, uh, this summer. Um, I'm David Preziosi, Executive Director of Preservation Dallas, and I want to uh, thank our, our sponsor for the Summer Scissors series. Uh, this year, which is uh, McCoy Collaborative. We're so happy to have them as our, our sponsor. Uh, and now I'd like to turn it over to Irene Allender, who will introduce our, our wonderful speaker and past uh, Preservation Dallas board president and board member. Uh, so I will turn it over to uh, Irene. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, so we just wanted to um, say thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I hope that you can come and see some of the other sessions that we have. Our next one coming up is next Tuesday. It's August 17th and it is Murder It Was, the death of two women that shocked Dallas in the 1910s. And that's with Renee Schmitz. It should be a really wonderful talk. Um, after that, we've got a few more. We've got um, Modern Jails, we've got Roadside Parks, the Farnsworth House, and the Rock Wall, Rock Wall. Um, so tonight, we have Nikki Emery. She's an architectural historian, cons conservator, and licensed architect. Her experience includes research, documentation, assessment, and site analysis of the existing buildings, design and adaptive use of historic structures, historic building and site preservation plans, historic context, 
writing and submitting National Park Service approved National Register of Historic Place nominations and federal environmental compliance documents. Her research in architectural conservation fieldwork includes the early American architecture of the Northeast, West, Southwest, South, and Midwest. She has extensive architectural conservation, conditions assessments, research, and documentation experience, including the preservation of historic structures, structure reports. She has participated in several important documentation and conservation fieldwork projects, including National Historic Landmarks, two Save America's Treasure Sites, and one World Monuments Fund Watch Site. Her field experience includes masonry, finishes, and plaster conservation, as well as conservation of public arts of various media, including masonry, concretes, metals, and architectural coatings. She is a professional associate of the American Institute of Conservation and serves as a current chair of the AIC's architecture specialty group. She is the owner and senior conservator of ADAPT, Readapt Preservation and Conservation, the firm she opened in 2014. She's also past president of Preservation Dallas and a faithful member. And so now I welcome Nikki Emery. If anybody has any questions during the talk, please put them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll, we'll ask them as we go along or we'll just wait until the end. And so I, now I welcome Nikki. Thanks, Irene and David. It's so nice to be joining you virtually. I'm in Chicago right now uh, where we've relocated to, but I try to be in Dallas as often as I can, either in person or through Zoom. <laughs> so, uh, and we have your weather today. So everyone here is really not equipped. So it's kind of nice to be the one for a change who's equipped for the weather here. So um, in any case, we'll go ahead and get started. And tonight I'm gonna to just present a little bit of information to you about the public art uh, program in the city of Dallas and what we do as conservators to help protect the art for the public. So first of all, um, what is public art? Um, generally, public art is what you're going to be seeing when you walk around the city uh, go downtown, go to other places within uh, the city in our parks, in our plazas, in our libraries. Um, public art can kind of be distinguished, uh, often it's distinguished as a separate entity from fine art, but that's really more of a, um, of a mischaracterization. It still is very much treated by conservators and the artists, of course, as fine art. Uh, it's just a little bit different in that we as the public are the ones generally funding the public art, the acquisition of it, and the maintenance of it, and the ongoing care. So this quote that you see is from the city of Dallas Office of Cultural Affairs, or excuse me, Office of Arts and Culture, they have changed their name, so I'll make sure I will probably mix it up throughout the presentation. Um, but basically, it's art for everyone to enjoy. And, and usually, this is the art you're going to get to interact with when you go to places like Pioneer Plaza. Sometimes that's great, and sometimes it can be problematic, depending on the amount of love that it gets. So why public art? Uh, why is it important? So it's really of the people, it's of the city, it's, it's here for our, everybody's enjoyment. It really celebrates our culture uh, as citizens. And of course that evolves over time and we'll get a little bit into that kind of toward the end of, of my talk, but it really informs um, the civic memory and um, reflects the time and place in which it is erected or installed. Um, it's an interactive process. So the community is gen generally very involved in the selection of the art or the artist, uh, along with, uh, if it happens to be part of a larger project, it can be part of, uh, that can be uh, considered by design professionals, 
civic leaders, uh, funding agencies, uh, and the like. But it really shows that we're investing in the future of our city and the folks who are reflective of the communities within our city. So this map is a snapshot showing the locations of public art in the city of Dallas. So you can kind of see there is a bit of a concentration um, downtown and also at uh, Love Field. Love Field has a, a really nice public art um, component to it that was really realized after the Love Field modernization program. But you can see there is public art all over the city. There's hardly, I, I don't think there is a neighborhood that doesn't have at least one piece of public art. And like I said, it's usually going to be um, in, in a public building, for, for instance, a library, uh, park and rec centers often are places where you're gonna see public art. Um, and just to kind of highlight, if you'd like to know more about where you can find public art and know more about the public art that you do run across, the city has a website where you can go online, click um, this interactive map, and it will pull up the specific pieces of art that are in that location. And it'll tell you a little bit more about the specific piece and the artist. So this is, for instance, uh, right in front of City Hall. This is Vertebrae in Three Pieces by Henry Moore. And we'll talk a little bit more about that piece, but I would encourage everyone to go online and you can kind of create your own little walking tour and learn more about the art in your community. And I believe that this would also be available on your phone. So if you wanted to really take a walking tour, um, and learn along the way. I believe that that is something that you can do. But of course, um, if anyone knows differently, please let us know. So to introduce conservation of, the pub of public art, I'm gonna show you a few examples of the challenges that we face. In the top uh, image, that is the, um, mural called The Trees, the Sky, the Water that was painted by Carlos Don Juan and the Sour Grapes Collective. If you're not familiar with this massive mural, this is a kind of a um, perspective, or not really even a perspective, kind of a, a strange view <laughs> of it. And um, it totals about 8,000 square feet. And it's on the ramps of the Jefferson Street Viaduct going from downtown into Oak Cliff. As you're riding the, um, riding the trolley or driving, if you look kind of over the side, you'll see these beautiful murals, but unfortunately, they have always had a bit of a problem with tagging, well, not a bit of a real problem with tagging, and um, right now they're, they don't look like they should. But this was a project that I worked on years ago uh, to mitigate some of, that, some of that graffiti. And just for scale, you can see me kind of on the right side behind the car. Um, I'm by the figure that's kind of striped um, red and yellow and pink with the green eyes. But it's a charming piece and, and it's very beloved by the community, but unfortunately, um, it's also kind of an um, inviting place for alternative street art, let's say. Um, another challenge we face is just time. Um, weathering occurs, uh, a specific site's con condition can um, impact it, whether it's in a flower bed or um, if it gets a lot of sun, if it um, is a place under a tree where birds like to nest and you get a lot of bird droppings and things like that. All of these things can be uh, impactful on public art. The beautiful little elephant called uh, Elephant's Child is at the zoo and children love to interact with it. So um, sometimes love 
is also a challenge because it you know wears down the patina and the wax coating, which is protective and exposes the um, the bronze beneath. So these are all just challenges that that we face. And of course, with any um, you know municipality, there are always budget challenges, initial funding for uh, proper installation and proper um, uh, materials, but then also maintenance is also a challenge. So if you're ever faced with the opportunity to advocate for conservation and funding of maintenance of historic buildings and public art, I encourage you to speak to your council member. All right, so public art conservators, who are we? Um, you know, there are a lot of people know art conservation just, you know, through the media or going to museums and um, public art conservators do the same type of work. Um, the, it's always a little bit of a finessing between art and history and, um, and you know, the engineering of how the artwork is put together, um, chemistry, um, sometimes biology, uh, we have to deal with pests and things like that. So we kind of wear a lot of hats as art conservators, but I always like to uh, explain to people when you're in public art, it's sort of like that old saying that Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in high heels. And I kind of feel like sometimes we, we have a few challenges on our hands that, um, that museum conservators may not always have. We often are dealing with um, situations like weather. You know, in Dallas, we have often <laughs> summers where we simply cannot apply materials that we need to apply to conserve art, uh, like paint. <laughs> You're in painting on a mural and the, um, and the paint sticks to the brush before you can get it to the wall, it's a problem. Um, we have to deal with wind, we have to deal with rain, just all of these other little things that sometimes um, makes life a little bit interesting. Um, but that's part of the fun. And I say contortionists because you'll kind of see a little bit about that when, when we look at our case studies. So how do we conserve public art? There are, um, just like any other kind of art, there's a lot of study that goes into it before we're able to actually um, make that happen physically. We undertake a site visit where we look at the art, the conditions, and determine things like what kind of budget do we need to put together? What kind of treatment might we consider? And we do a full condition assessment of, um, of the conditions that we're seeing. So we'll look at um, the material that the art is applied to, for instance, in this case, which is that same mural on the upper left-hand corner. Uh, we look at the underlying concrete. Is there, um, is there something happening with the concrete that is affecting the artwork? Um, you know, what are all of the, the conditions that we're seeing from soiling to graffiti to scratches from cars running into it, which is a thing here. Um, we have a lot of conversations with the client. We need to understand their expectations, their budgetary restrictions, um, if there are any, and what their goals are. Um, often with with we'll call it fine art or art in a museum or in a, in a um, gallery. Conservation is, is often very, very um, light touch. It's a light touch. We don't want to put our own imprint all, um, on the art so that it's um, mistaken for the artist's hand. We want to make sure that the artist's hand shows through and that there's no mistake that that, that intervention happened. It's very subtle, but you do want to try to distinguish that so that in the future that could be reversed. The idea is reversibility. But in public art, 
technical is a full restoration, not always, but that can be one of the goals of the clients and we just have to understand that. We often have conversations with the artists themselves if they're willing and they're living, um, but if they are not, we often will have conversations with their foundation to make sure that whatever we're doing is, would have the blessing of the artist. Uh, we conduct a lot of research into those items, but also the materials um, to make sure that we understand what kind of materials were used originally and then how we can uh, be compatible with that. So we're not causing any, um, unante any unanticipated causes of any material we would put on. Um, Sometimes, you know, just with chemistry, things can react in ways that you don't anticipate unless, unless you've done your homework. So we will then document everything that we're doing as we go. We do that through drawings, photographs, notes, uh, making sure that we're keeping track of everything that we have done. We'll conduct testing, and those are some images of testing that you can see on the image, just uh, different dwell times for paint removal, um, different colors that we're, we're trying to match. Um, and then uh, mock-ups on the lower left-hand corner, I was um, given the approval, which was very nice, um, to create a mock-up of, uh, of a test wall on a blank wall. So there are four total walls to the viaduct. One is blank and faces uh, east. And there, are no, there were no murals on that wall. So I was granted permission to create a huge mock-up and test the effects of different uh, anti-graffiti coatings and how they would weather in the town. So that uh, is what you're seeing there. And then of course, then we'll undertake our treatments. Um, the image that you see in the upper left-hand corner, the, the kind of grayed out area where I'm, I'm actually working on it was covered in graffiti and overpaint. And we ended up needing to take off that overpaint down to where we could see the original and then in paint over the top of it. So um, that was part of that treatment. And then of course, reporting and documentation. We, we present a completion report to the client that details everything that we did and everything that we used so that in the future, other conservation um, efforts can be compatible with that or they'll understand if something didn't go as planned or aged, um, it can be removed and retreated. So for the first um, case study, I would like to share with you uh, Everybody on the call, I'm sure, or on the Zoom has, I'm sure, seen these up close and in person. These are, of course, the um, sculptures entitled U.S., Mexico, and France by Raul Josette at the Fair Park, Fair Park Esplanade. And um, there are three of six 20-foot high uh, statues on 12-foot high pedestals. And there are six female figures that flank the uh, entrance to the Hall of State building along the Esplanade Fountain. And these three are the work of Raul Josette, and then the other three are the work of Lawrence Tenney Stevens. And we were, I say we, I uh, was collaborating with um, Deborah Rodriguez of Past Matters, uh, Catherine Hayes, and then local hero David Landrum. Uh, and some of you might know him as Wolf Landrum, and he is um, a wonderful guy that you can find at Dallas Heritage Village. So, and hopefully he's on the call. Um, but anyway, he also helped with this. And what, um, what we were faced with were obviously very soiled uh, concrete sculptures um, that hadn't been cleaned in quite some time. So, here you'll see up close on the left, some of the conditions that were typical. So there's a lot of atmospheric soiling. There was biological growth. So um, uh, molds and fungus and 
other wonderful little creatures that love to sit in that atmospheric soiling and put roots down into the concrete surface. So um, that was a bit of a challenge. And then there were also areas where um, soluble salts had uh, collected and kind of that's what that white streaking is from, on the front of the sculpture. And that's a very, very hard and tenacious salt that's very difficult to remove. Um, and so what we did was um, the four of us, we were able to access the entire sculptures using a 40 foot boom lift. And so that kind of brings into the heavy equipment operator skills that we typically use. And uh, we undertook detailed cleaning of the concrete. And um, we used a detergent, a very mild uh, detergent that is, doesn't react with either concrete or the soiling or the biological growth so that everything we did was very neutral and didn't cause any adverse reactions. And then we also, um, you can kind of see it on the right side, we were using uh, dental picks to remove some of that um, more tenacious salts and then some of the embedded biological growth. So um, I sometimes will say that conservation at this scale is sort of like, um, Painting the, painting the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, as soon as they're done, they have to start again. And, um, you know, public art in an outdoor environment, it's always going to get a little more soiled the day after you finish. And that's just, that's just part of the maintenance and why it's so crucial to um, keep up with it. But um, that is just kind of one example of some of the work that we have done. This is the before and the after of that of one of those pieces. Um, so you can really see that, that it made a huge difference, but of course it's it's dirty again. So it's time to time to get back up there on that uh, boom lift. And another uh, case study that I would, would like to present to you is Henry Moore's vertebrae in three pieces. And if you spend a lot of time downtown or at City Hall, this is the sculpture that's on the north side of City Hall. And um, just a little bit more about this piece. Um, in, it was commissioned in 1976 by the city. Um, and uh, they commissioned Henry Moore to create a sculpture to be placed in the plaza. And um, Moore had been recommended to the city by Ian Pei, who was the architect of Dallas City Hall. And um, the Dallas piece, as it's also known, it would be the third time that Moore and Pei um, collaborated together as one uh, cohesive statement. So in designing the sculpture, Moore felt the piece would need to be massive to complement City Hall's um, brutalist architecture and the wide horizontal plane of the plaza. He designed the sculpture to be organic and curved so that it contrasted with the geometry and block-like architecture of City Hall. And um, according to Moore, understanding this work comes with experiencing it. And it is really one where you can go around and in and really kind of get enveloped by, by the piece. And um, he positioned the pieces in a triangle so that that invited viewers to walk inside. And he is um, quoted as saying that it's a good thing if someone does not immediately tell you what it is and what it is about, because otherwise there would be nothing more to know about it. A thing should have some mystery and some unexpected things, which only you find out by being with it and experiencing it. And um, it is a very wonderful piece. Um, this is a, pro a piece that I've worked on um, over the past several years, and we're really trying to um, get it to a condition where it's um, stable 
and um, and really uh, slowing some of the corrosion that has occurred. It's been subject to a lot of uh, vandalism in the past. Uh, it's very inviting. Uh, with, with that being immersed inside of it, it's also a hidey hole. So um, it has been subject to incised graffiti. Um, you find footprints in places where you don't know how the footprints got there, um, that kind of thing. So it does have some challenges. But um, one of the wonderful things about it is that it, it's just kind of a process for us to understand all of the conditions that have been happening over time. But um, generally what we'll do with this piece is we'll wash it uh, again with a very, very mild detergent and then wipe it down. Um, and then we, depending on the year and the condition that it is at, at that particular time, we will either apply a hot wax or a cold wax. And uh, in the picture on the right, that's uh, me applying a hot wax treatment. And what we'll do is we'll take um, uh, propane torches and we'll heat the metal very, very mildly. And then we apply a wax blend for outdoor sculptures. And um, that really brings out the color, brings out the luster and kind of tones down some of the um, graffiti and, and some of the other color variations and things like that. And it all then we'll buff it and uh, bring it to a really nice shine. And then um, um, when we cold wax it, we do the same thing, but just not with the heating. And so you can see on, uh, on the left just how shiny and glossy that it looks, um, which kind of disguises a little bit of the problems that it has, but it, um, it also is a protectant and it uh, helps the sculpture weather uh, so that it doesn't become uh, corroded. All right, for the third um, case study I'd like to present, this one is at the South Dallas Cultural Center and it's a series of five panels. Let me check my time. Um, series of five panels entitled African Contribution to, world, to the World, and it's by artist Emmanuel Gillespie. And these are um, uh, enameled steel. And uh, what we found when we arrived and did our conditions assessment were very discreet areas of, um, I'll show you, of corrosion and uh, damage to the enamel coating so that water as it drips down was making uh, rusty streaks and um, exposing that metal and, and causing some, some deterioration. And so what we did was we cleaned them again with our, our uh, wonderful detergent and then we treated for that corrosion and removed as much of it as possible. Then we went through and in-painted those losses so that there's a protective coating um, over that metal. Um, so you'll see that spot um, on the far left photograph um, is blown up in the photograph next to it. And then on the right, that is um, one area that was that was in painted. So the idea is just to kind of disguise those areas that were treated and protect them from future deterioration. Okay, and the last case study that I am going to present is another one that I worked on with Laura Pate and Amy Dobson of Brown Mountain. Um, and I should say that the, the vertebrae in three pieces, Henry Moore's piece at City Hall, we also worked together on that one too. I think I failed to mention that. And then also uh, David Wolf Landrum uh, participated in this one as well. And so if you're not familiar with this area, this is over near Bonton Farms in uh, South Dallas. This is by J.D. Evans, who is a local artist 
And this is his piece called The Park. It's, um, it's a 40 foot long concrete wall. It's eight inches thick. I think it's about 12 feet high. And it's painted on both sides. And this is a lovely piece. It is um, a park depicting, it's, it's in the park and it's depicting the park that it is in. So it's kind of a meta, a <laughs> little bit meta there, but um, it's a really beautiful piece. And um, we learned when we were working on this that the, the, in, the people within the imagery are residents or were residents of the neighborhood. And in fact, one young guy walked by at one point and said, um, are you gonna fix my, my grandma? And I said, what? I said, oh, that's my grandma in the, in the picture. And so it's, it's such a, it has such a connection with the place that it is. Um, it really means a lot to the community. So um, it kind of added a, an extra layer of importance and meaning to us, um, seeing how important it was to the community that it serves. So this is um, in Blair Park. It, used to be called Rochester Park. So if you get a chance to go out and take a look at it, I would encourage you to do so. Um, so here is his grandma. So you can see that um, there were a lot of condition issues with this one. There was a lot of fading uh, of, the, of the pigments. There were a lot of what we call fugitive pigments, which um, are you know, ones that are um, they don't really react very well with light uh, and, and have a really hard time staying true to color. Um, but we also had some issues like, um, like this pocking that, that we saw. We weren't exactly sure what caused this, but there were, there were these uh, losses and bubbles and blisters in the painted surface concentrated on the woman's face. There was also gum <laughs> on her tooth <laughs> and uh, just some, just some, you know, irregularities in the paint surface, chipping um, and other losses and, and a lot of fading that you'll see in the next um, few photographs. So in this case, the before is on the left and the after, of course, is on the right. And the paintings conservator who worked on this with us, Amy Dobson, we, um, she and I, we removed the, the paint that was not sound and then went in and in-painted those areas so that it blended with the original image. So that, um, and this is a little bit more of a restoration, um, conservation restoration so that we preserve the integrity of the paint coating so that it won't deteriorate as, as quickly in the future, but it also reintegrates the visual um, effects of the mural as it was originally intended by the artist. Here's another image of Amy in painting. So on the upper left-hand photograph, you'll see that the, uh, I think it's an egret, but if there's a bird person out there, please correct me. Um, there were a lot of, this fugitive pigment that I'm talking about, a lot of it was this white uh, pigment that was used. And um, we talked to Mr. Evans as part of our work to um, kind of get his blessing, but then also to learn more about what he had used. And he said that he had used house paint that he had got from Texas Paints. So that kind of gave us a little bit more of an idea of uh, what we might be facing. We, we still aren't quite sure what was going on with the white, but um, you can see that a lot of the back and, uh, and the leg and the face, uh, the little head of the bird were largely gone. Uh, fortunately, when Mr. Evans did this piece, he used pencil to kind of draw in these figures. So we had a really good, idea, and, and that pencil stayed on the wall, miraculously. Um, he did put an anti-graffiti coating over the top of it, we learned. So that's, but um, in any case, 
Amy was able to go through and, and paint very delicately um, that impression of, of the bird. And we did this on the figures of the mural so that it brought the artist's intent back. We didn't want to be too heavy handed, but um, you know, just to kind of get a very subtle uh, and a conservation approach. We weren't going to just go in with a ton of white paint um, because we don't want to make things too obvious when we're doing this type of work. And here's another example of, of one of the figures. This particular area had um, quite a bit of graffiti that was applied to it, as well as that fugitive pigment. So you'll see the jump rope was pretty much gone um, on the left figure, her sandals were pretty much gone. Same thing with the shoes on the uh, figure that's wearing the blue shirt. And the poor woman's skirt had become a slip. And um, one of the most interesting things about this artist as an aside is um, on this piece, we learned like all of, the, all of the figures are fully clothed. They all have either shorts or, um, you know, like tank tops under their clothes. So as <laughs> this paint was lost, they all had on underwear or shorts. So it was very interesting to learn how he built this imagery. Um, it was fascinating to really look and see how the artist treated his, his uh, subjects. And same thing for um, the, the playground equipment. It was really constructed. And uh, it, it was such an interesting, way to experience the artwork through his eyes kind of reconstructing what, um, what had been missing. So in any case, on the right, you can see that her shoes are back, her, her skirt is back, and the jump rope is back after conservation. So that concludes um, the work that I'd like to present on behalf of uh, my work and the Office of Arts and Culture. I did just want to touch on one thing that's kind of in the news, and it's a conversation that we're having as conservators um, kind of on a national level. And of course, after the murder of George Floyd, a lot of public art and monuments were tagged. And there, and I'm not saying, I, you know, I'm not going to say whether that's a good or a bad thing, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention that there is a conversation happening uh, that questions, you know, um, if public art is a statement about our time and our culture and our society, when we add to it through um, legitimate um, concerns, is it appropriate or not appropriate to remove that record? Um, again, I'm not gonna tell you what to think one way or the other, but it's a conversation that's, that's happening and it's an important conversation. And um, it's, it's very interesting to see how in some cases there have become, or how there have now been layers of um, public discourse that have occurred on or in our here and sometimes on our public art. Um, and then on the right, kind of looking back a little bit here or there <laughs> in the city of Dallas, one project that I participated in personally was in 2006 when DART demolish the deep Ellen uh, tunnels. And if, if y'all were back, were there back then or, or know people that are in deep Ellen and have been there for a really long time, you know that the, um, the tunnel, which was historic in and of itself, was, um, was a place for street artists to express themselves. And, um, and there was some absolutely fabulous art uh, unsanctioned art that was on the tunnel. And in 2006, I was part of a documentation project for the Historic American Engineering Record. And uh, prior to demolition as part of 
legal uh, responsibilities that I won't talk about today. It's another conversation. Uh, we documented it and did drawings and, and uh, large format photography to preserve uh, the memory of the tunnel prior to demolition. And uh, the ironic thing, in my opinion, is you know now Deep Ellum is, is becoming more expensive. There are new apartments going in. The artists often aren't able to stay because of, they're getting priced out. But what's now going into Deep Ellum as part of almost every development project is a street mural. Um, to show how artsy it is. So anyway, just a little bit ironic. Another thing for food for thought. So I'd like to just open it up for questions. I think I'm, oh wow, right on time. So we've got a lot of time for questions. So um, perfect. We need to answer anything you have. Okay. Um, so I have a few here. Um, one says on the Gillespie piece, what was the material that fixed the damage? It looked fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting because that's, that's metal. It's, um, it is uh, enamel metal. What we ended up doing, uh, and, and I will tell you that, I mean, obviously don't try this at home. It's for professional to do only. Um, we have a lot of materials in our kit and usually it depends on the underlying material. So, but for that particular case, what we did was after we washed it with um, a soap that's called, um, oh gosh, now I'm gonna forget what kind of soap it is. Um, anyway, it'll come to me. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, Oh, sorry, Orvis paste, which is made by Johnson & Johnson, and it's actually uh, made to wash horses. Uh, it's just a super mild non-ionic or anionic uh, detergent that doesn't react with anything. Uh, so we washed it, we dried it, we, re we removed the rust with uh, a Dremel tool and sandpaper and made it kind of a feathered edge. And then we, oh, sorry, my dog is in a bark now, I'm sorry. Um, we primed it with a direct to metal primer and then we used testors. So if you were a kid and you painted uh, little matchbox cars or figurines, um, sometimes you use testors, but we use um, that particular type of paint because it's a great direct to metal um, paint that comes in a lot of different colors. We can kind of color match and um, it's, it's suitable for outdoor use. So sometimes, um, sometimes it's a little bit of a uh, super scientific, but also very practical uh, combination of things that we use. But yay, model builders. <laughs> Very cool. Um, let's see, there's another one. It says, in looking at the website with public art for the city of Dallas, there's no mention of easel paintings. I assume there's a separate list of such works, such as the paintings of Frank Ray in the main Dallas Public Library. I would expect there are other paintings or prints in Dallas City Hall. Is there a list of other works of such works maintained and are those pieces also conserved periodically? Um, I do not know personally, but um, I know that the, I think that the, that website may be a work in progress. I don't know if it's 100% complete. So um, that may not necessarily be on there or sometimes, I. I and please, if, if uh, Lynn Rushton or, or Kay Carlos are on the Zoom, please correct me and let me know. But um, I, there also could be like, some of it might belong to the Office of Arts and Culture. Maybe some of it belongs to the building. I think that there are a lot of situations where um, the ownership or you know, stewardship, I should say, might be different. Uh, you know, might belong to the library. And uh, there, you know, in, in the city realm, there are a lot of different, um, you know, tiers of how public art is uh, is uh, 
maintained and uh, for lack of a better term, owned. Oh, Irene, you're on mute. Right. <laughs> I think that is all the questions that we have for right now. Okay, I see uh, some chat. Oh, I have one more. Um, okay. How often do they touch up the Moore sculpture at City Hall? Um, I've been working on it annually. And then there is another conservator, Brad Ford Smith, who has been doing the washing, uh, periodic washing of it, just to clean and, you know, remove uh, soiling and, um, you know, it to make sure that it's all um, maintained and then observes it. And then we communicate with one another. And if he sees something odd, he'll tell me. And then that way, you know, we work together um, on, on treating it correctly. Uh, before Brad worked on it, uh, Laura Pate with Brown Mountain had been doing the washing. So it's kind of a tag team effort. It, one of the great things about um, working in Dallas and then working with Dallas with, in, in Dallas with other conservators is um, the community that we have and the collaboration that we have is absolutely phenomenal. And I couldn't wish for better colleagues um, and better clients. So uh, if, you, if you see staff of the Office of Arts and Culture, thank them because <laughs> they really work hard to make sure that, um, that the art in the public's care is, is being maintained. Definitely. A really great community. Okay, um, we have one more um, and I think our hour will be up. Does the city have a budget to convert, conserve and protect the city's public art? Yes, it does. And, um, and fortunately that has really improved um, in the last years. And yes, the, the, the money has been there and the uh, will has been there and the staff has been there. So it has been a really good, um, a really good situation for the art and for the public. Um, you'll, you'll often see us out there in our little yellow vests and, um, and we are doing our best, but you know, of course you can always use more money, um, especially when it comes to maintaining art because you do have a priority list and um, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So, um, any, like I said before, anytime you can advocate, please do. Wonderful. I'm going to just push forward on one more thing. There, there is a slide with information. If you'd like more information about anything that I've talked about today, uh, you can, uh, I'll, I'll, I've got my information on the next slide as well. Feel free to contact me and I'm happy to share any kind of information that I can. All right. Well, thank you, Nikki, so much. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Yeah, definitely. We love seeing you back here in Dallas. <laughs> yeah. I love being back in Dallas. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for inviting me. This was great. Great. All right, everybody. Well, that is the end of session two of our Summer Sizzler series. We'll see you next week with Renee Schmidt. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.